So, Peter, you've recently written an intro to a new edition for the Critique of the Gotha program. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Right. Well, the Critique of Gotha program has been a work of great interest to me, as well as to a lot of other people for a number of years, but and especially because it's the place where Marx most directly addresses, though it's not the only place that he addresses, the nature of a, post, a possible post-capitalist society. And one of the main concerns I've had for the last decade or more is that the, one of the great deficiencies of today's radical movements in general, and in the United States in particular, is an absence of discussion of that question. Or approaches are given to what constitutes a socialist society that are rather standard and traditional, ranging from either a Keynesian social wealth, democratic welfare state as the alternative, an enhanced welfare state, or to a, you know, a traditional Marxist-Leninist approach, which I think has proven to be completely non-viable. So what I'm interested in is trying to gain some theoretical foundations for rethinking of the question of what constitutes a, a viable social, socialist alternative. And the critique of the Gotha program, obviously, is one of the first works that come to mind in light of that. But there's a broader consideration that took me to the critique, and that is, what is really the object of Marx's critique of capital? even if you put aside for a second how much, how little or how much he had to say about an alternative to capitalism, uh, I think the critique of the Gotha program and related works illuminate that the question of time is the central determination. Post-Marx, Marxists have generally thought of the property relation or who controls which property form or what property form determines the form of a non-capitalist society as being the decisive issue that separates capitalism from non-capitalist societies. And I think what we gain from the critique of the Gotha program, especially when it's read in light of Marx's entire critique of political economy, is that that's a very superficial approach that fails to get to the gist of what Marx's object of critique really is. And the object of his critique really is how a certain modality of time comes to determine our lives within the capitalist mode of production. And unless that temporal kind of modality is eliminated, uprooted, unless the conditions that give birth to it and make it necessary are uprooted, we're actually not going to have an exit from capitalism, even if we collectivize property, even if we see state power and try to impose a progressive social program. Unless the uprooting goes deep into that question, we're not going to make much progress. And we can't afford to make many more mistakes, given the amount of time we have left, given the state of, our, of our capital's destruction of the environment, and also given how many false starts we've had in revolutionary movements. Right. So this is getting to the kind of core nature that Marx describes in, you know, volume one about socially necessary labor time. Do you want to give a, like a description of how this operates and what would need to be broken to get rid of this, you know, value production? Kind of the, the uh, more superficial popularized treatments of Marx's so-called labor theory of value is what? It basically says that the value of a commodity is determined by the amount of labor time that is in, uh, required to produce it. But of course, that is the Ricardian theory of value. That's not actually Marx's labor theory of value. I, I prefer Duny- Ryan Dunievskaya's phrase, which she used in her 1958 work, Marxism and Freedom, that Marx has not so much a labor theory of value as a value theory of labor. What difference does that make is pretty important, and here is why is Marx makes it very clear from the first pages of Capital, of course, as well as in other works like Value, Price, and Profit, other works that come before Capital, that it actually isn't the amount of labor time embodied in a product that determines its value. It's the average amount of time that is necessary to produce that product on a world global scale. Uh, Now, that average is something that is not determined by any agents of Capital directly or immediately, nor is it certainly arranged by the producers themselves who are subordinate to the despotic plan of capital at the point of reduction. That temporal determination, that average amount of time that is socially necessary to produce a commodity is constantly shifting and changing depending on the productivity of labor, right? So addition of new technologies will shorten the amount of time required to produce a different commodity. If, let's say, the global average, the necessary average is, let's say, 20 hours to produce a given a given device, if you're producing it at 30 hours, from the standpoint of, of the value form, the extra 10 hours that you're performing above the average is not creating any value. So the workers can, cre- can work all they want, but their labor is actually not augmenting value unless it conforms to this social average. 
That is what we call socially necessary labor time. It acts as a disciplinary mechanism behind the backs of the producers, both the workers and the capitalists, by the way, and it compels them to adhere to this standard. Now, nobody knows what that average is exactly. Nobody knows what it is immediately, because as Marx says in Capital, value does uh, not reveal its secrets immediately. It does not have its, the commodity does not have its value stamped on its forehead, right? Um, that is uh, understood or, or, or manifested uh, through the laws of competition. So if you're producing that widget in 30 hours and your competitors are producing it in 20 and 20, more closely corresponds to the socially necessary labor time, sooner or later, over the long haul, and it might be a very long haul, but sooner or later, your competitors on the global market who produce it more efficiently at a lower cost of production in 20 hours instead of 30, they're going to drive you out of business. Now, you can temporarily protect yourself from that with protectionist measures, with import substitution, with all kinds of other mechanisms, state control of the economy, et cetera, political direction of the circuits of capital, all that you can play around with, and that seemed to be a way to get around this issue, right? But it eventually catches up with you because the world economy is a global economy. The capitalist economy is a global economy. We are no longer living in the era of national economies and haven't been so for the last century. So that's what socially necessary labor time is. It's this, it's this temporal, it's, it's, it's this social average that constantly imposes and reimposes upon itself, itself upon us. And we have to conform our lives to it. So it, it's not just that we're not free because we don't own the instruments of production in an immediate sense. or we don't own the means of production. Of course, that's a fundamentally critical problem. But even if you have a cooperative in which the workers cooperatively own collectively the means of production in an isolated area or in a small, on a small level, a small venue, sooner or later, they're going to be subjected to the disciplinary agent of socially necessary labor time. And therefore, they're not really in control. So when we think we're in control, even when we do think we're in control, we're very often not, because there has to be a global systemic transformation of the capitalist mode of production that allows for a different organization of time that is based on the organic, sensuous temporality that adheres to human subjectivity, rather than an abstract, indeterminate, quantitative kind of temporality that imposes itself upon us as an external force. Right. So one one way I think in the book you you put it was that you know it's a kind of collapsing this this distinction between concrete and abstract labor. Absolutely right. It's a difficult concept to get Marx's concept of the dual character of labor, by which he means that every act of laboring involves both of these moments. These are not separate moments. It's not like first I engage in concrete laboring, like I'm a tailor, or I'm a doctor, or a lawyer, or I'm a worker on the production line. And then somehow my labor becomes abstracted. There is an interpretation that reads Marx that way that says labor only becomes abstracted once the product of labor enters the sphere of monetary circulation. But I don't think that that is can be held up in relationship to uh, Marx's text. Neither do I think they're co-determinative, that uh, the monetary expression of value is co-determinative to the existence of value to begin with. Um, and that would be a long discussion to get into that kind of debate. But the basic I- idea here is that for Marx, the actual amount of time that you labor, which we can call the concrete laboring activity that you engage in, I work five hours and I'm doing this type of specific task, that does not augment value, right? What augments value is when labor, that concrete labor becomes subsumed under the hegemony of social necessary labor time and therefore socially necessary labor time becomes the measure of value. And therefore, it's the split between abstract and concrete labor that in the very instant of laboring, you're both laboring concretely, but you're also, your concrete laboring is adhering to this social abstraction. The fact that this is going on simultaneously, right, is the critical driving determinant of Marx's analysis of capitalism, which I I think a careful reading of chapter one, two, and three of Capital brings this out rather clearly. But there's another implication here that implies that there's also two types of temporality. There's a kind of temporality or time determination, which is actual labor time. I work this many hours, okay? And then there is another type of time determination. You must work this many hours in order to augment this amount of value. Otherwise, you are being going to be pushed aside for somebody else who will adhere to that standard. So one of the big problems in Marx scholarship is a lot of people... Marx talks about labor time, and they don't 
catch when he's talking about actual labor time and when he's talking about socially necessary labor time. And it's not difficult to make that conflation, to confuse the two. Some really great thinkers, including Herbert Marcuse and George Lukash, kind of ended up making this kind of conflation at various times in their work. It's a difficult thing to sort out, but it's a critical determination to, to say that there's a difference between the actual amount of hours that a given individual works and the amount of hours in which that individual works that counts from the point of view of capital as valuable. Right. So like we, we can see from socially necessary labor time that it rewards actors within the economy based upon the differences in their productivity. So if I am making sandwiches to sell at, at a fair, I'm, I'm rewarded uh, monetarily when I sell them more based upon not, not on the specific amount of hours I do, but on the amount of socially necessary uh, labor I perform. Right. Now, one thing that I didn't deal with in my Marx book, which I will in my next, <laughs> which I'm working on, is how race and gender plays into this dynamic. Because it's very easy to view this as purely an economic determination, right? And there are many who claim that Marx's category of abstract labor posits a kind of homogenization of labor and a flattening out of all different various types of labor into a single uniform uh, homogeneous kind of labor, which therefore presumes the annulment of differences of gender, differences based on nationality, racial determinations, etc., but you can look at it from a very different angle, right? What is it that determines the ability, as you just discussed, of one worker to make those sandwiches and adhere to the socially necessary labor time versus another who doesn't? I mean, there's all kinds of factors that go into that besides how hard an individual is working. It's what kind of tools they're given, what kind of state of machinery or technology they're working with, what kind of workplace environment are they in? If you can force workers to produce more or at a certain rate, at a higher rate of exploitation, in other words, by undercutting their forms of possible resistance to this domination of the law of value, this works very well in the eyes of capital, right? This is exactly what capital wants, to augment value at all costs, and it will go through any route to try to obtain that. And racial discrimination plays a very, very big role in that, right? If you're the last hired, you're very often the first fired. You're under that regimen of discipline you're very often slotted into jobs that don't have the kind of technological determinations that would earn your work to be uh, on the level of what is accorded suddenly, hey, here is a new social, socially necessary average of this. And therefore you find all of a sudden you're out of work or you're subjected to even conditions of, of hyper or super exploitation. So th this, this distinction of actual labor time and socially necessary labor time it's not an annulment of difference. It's not like concrete labor becomes assumed by abstract labor and everything becomes leveled out or homogenized. That's the drive of capital to do this in general. But in order to achieve that drive, it has to make use of difference. And that difference includes racialized differences, gender differences, all kinds of differences, and certainly nationalist differences. So a lot of things play into this. The problem with not uh, identifying this is that then a category like racial capitalism becomes somewhat, somewhat problematic. What does it actually mean? Does it mean that you can have capitalism without racism? Can you have racism without capitalism? If not, then how is racism and capitalism actually linked? How exactly, not just how historically, but how logically are they linked? And that is, I think, a question that has opened up in a much greater way when you focus on the critical time determination rather than focusing on the property form as a determination which is not to dismiss the importance of property rights and property forms. Of course, the working class cannot achieve emancipation within the existing property relations of modern capitalism, right? There has to be a, a, a destruction of the property right of the bourgeoisie, and there has to be a, a recuperation of that right by the working class itself. But that's just where the battle begins. That's just the very first step. That's not, that's not the end step. Right. This was something that you kind of made plain in the in the book, your 2012 book, I think, the terms of Marx's concept of the terms of capitalism, where you focused. I was surprised. I've read, I read it maybe like 10 years ago and rereading it. I was surprised how much you focused on the, the point of alienation as being primary. Right. The problem is that capitalism does not reveal its secrets to us very immediately or quickly, right? Uh, as Marx used that famous phrase, consciousness is, it's post-festum, it's after the feast, right? 
So we, we grasp things with our natural, normal, everyday consciousness. We see the results. We see the phenomenal appearance. The essence does not immediately appear to us. If the essence did immediately appear to us, all this theoretical work wouldn't be necessary, right? But one of the things that makes a living within the epoch of capitalism just inevitable is that things are not as they appear, okay? In a pre-capitalist society, social relations are much more transparent. So if you think about Native American societies, for instance, before the European intervention, they didn't have to worry, I don't think, about the distinction of appearance and essence. But we do, because we are living right now within this capitalist behemoth, right, which has done so much to destroy Native American life uh, perspectives on life. So the, the point here is that it's, un, it, it's, of course, and especially in Marxist time, completely understandable that you're going to say the first and foremost task of communists is the abolition of private property. Because without that, there's no step towards the empowerment of the working class. And that is especially the case, of course, when you have uh, societies which are governed by free market relationships and in which there's little or no or zero worker input or control in the means of production. Now, there's plenty of places in the world where that still prevails, but there's other places in the world where there is some degree, especially with union representation, in some cases, like in Europe, representation of union officials and corporate board of directors, etc. But that's not ownership of the means of production by the associated producers in a freely associated way. But it's understandable that that property fetish, as I call it, would become predominant in much of Marxism because the form in which you're living in, in many free market capitalist societies makes that appear to be the fundamental issue, the property right. But you see, this is why the rise of Stalinism and the transformation of the Russian Revolution into Stalinism and the emergence of so many regimes afterwards that called themselves socialist or communist, that were in no ways either socialist or communist, but state capitalist, why this sheds a whole new light on things. Because now you're living in a state-controlled economy where there is no private ownership of means of production in the, tradi the traditional sense of the word. What, so what, what then happens, right? I mean, now the state or the collectivized property form is the, actually the vehicle of the working class's subjection. So what is common to both of these forms, whether it's a state capitalism calling itself communism, or whether it's simply private capitalism that makes no pretense not to be what it is, what is common to both of them? Well, the alienation of the product from the producer could be somewhat addressed by both systems. You can have a social democratic welfare state that tries to lessen that, lessen that alienation of the product from the producer, or you can have a, a state capitalist or a, a Stalinist regime. The most extreme example might be Pol Pot in Cambodia, where you literally eliminate any inequality by eliminating <laughs> any property right other than that which is held by those in power through the Communist Party, whatever it called itself. But the point is, in both cases, the conditions of labor are alienated. The worker is, maintains their alienation from the very activity of producing. They're not in control of the process of work, and therefore their work takes on an alienated form. Well, when those conditions prevail, value production prevails, because abstract labor is, is separable from alienated labor. But that is what makes labor alienated to begin with, is that it, it doesn't mean that your all labor becomes monotonous and routine and abstract in that sense. You can have highly concrete, highly skilled, highly differentiated labor, but it's still homogenized in relationship to the time determination established by the quantum of socially necessary labor time or the measure of socially necessary labor time. So, yeah, alienation is a really, really big issue. Marx is, uh, makes it, it says in the 1844 manuscripts, and it's a passage which puzzles many people because uh, it rubs against their presuppositions. He says, private, it's, private property is not the origin of alienated labor. He says that directly several times. He says, alienated labor is the cause of private property. Now, once gulps that down and accepts it, that alienated labor is what necessitates private property. Private property in the sense of class property, that is, it could be either the state property or it could be private corporate property. But it's alienated labor that necessitates it, because if the worker does not control their laboring activity in whatever way, shape, or form, there has to be an alien class entity to control it for them. And that is why the class relations of capitalism may historically result from property formations. But logically, it's the alienated relationships themselves that take priority. So in other words, it's a critique of human relations, not simply a critique or predominantly a critique of property relations. Right. You have a quote in the book where Marx says, this type of abolition of private property is only a regression, a sham universality. To abolish capital, 
this is you you writing here to abolish capital the negation of private property must itself be negated yes this is where he's he's drawing in from hegel uh, if there's any place where marx is standing hegel right side up it's not a phrase i love that much but <laughs> somewhat misleading but in this case that's exactly what he's doing right that he's taking hegel's concept that that every stage of negativity every stage of development in the progress of consciousness and self-consciousness and reason etc also displays its dependence upon the object of its critique and so when a process of negation occurs and you achieve a kind of at least apparent transcendence of a given set of contradictions a new standpoint a new conceptual con- standpoint of consciousness is reached and yet it's within that very new stage that new contradictions manifest themselves that have not been resolved and that become newly one becomes newly aware of or the, the spirit becomes newly aware of and therefore cont- the process now has to continue because it's the awareness of lack and deficiency that sparks desire and that sparks negativity right and, and which sparks consciousness all consciousness for hegel is desire right and all desire is driven by that which is lacking the lack of fulfillment of desire so what marx is taking that hegel's notion that the true transcendence of the contradiction occurs through not just the negation, but the negation of the negation. And now Marx is saying, well, we have, you know, a communist movement. He didn't invent communism. He didn't invent the communist movement. That was around long before he came on the scene. It may have been a rather incoherent movement. Didn't have much theoretical articulation yet in the 1830s and 40s, but it was there. And now Marx is saying, yes, your concentration on the property relation is important, but that's just the first step, the negation of private property, unless it leads and and leads right away towards transforming the alienated human relations, human relations at the point of production. Then if you get another property form that manifests the still existing class and production domination of existing society in which the workers are not actually in full control. So in that situation, there has to be a form of property that emerges that is itself an expression of an alienated condition. And I would call that state property. State collectivized property is in the Soviet Union, communist China, etc., was that alienated form of a property relationship, which was not reducible to private property. So if you focus your critique of capitalism purely on private property, not only are you kind of missing out on the historical problem of how to explain the problem of Stalinism, but you're missing out on the contemporary issue, even if you forgot about the history of Stalinism, of what is necessary in order to begin an exit from capitalism. Because we can we can re- rerun that script all over again by you know nationalizing property and trying to give the state and the public sphere a greater share in the economy and reduce the scale of privatization all things of which I'm completely in favor of, but if that's where if, if that becomes the defining parameters of a socialist project, it doesn't point you to a way out of capitalism. As well, we see like very very little emphasis among people theorizing about the nature of like a new communist society, there is not very much emphasis upon this destroying the alienated, this this alienated form of labor, much more upon these kind of ideas of like computation and, you know, central planning. Right. And that's so much easier, right? I mean, it is very hard to envision a transcendence of capitalism in the law of value. It's much easier to assume, as a number of people do, that and more meaning people, by the way, who are trying to think out what an alternative to capitalism represents, it's much easier to to think about, well, we come into power and we organize this new form of distribution. We collectivize the productive apparatus, etc. It seems to be a clear way to present a socialist alternative. But precisely because it's so clear, <laughs> it's wrong. <laughs> because, again, we come back to consciousness proceeds post festum, right? We are all trapped in the phenomenal forms of the given social formation we're living in. None of us are sitting at the right hands of God looking down upon the world, right? Uh, we're all entrapped within this system in which uh, that famous phrase of Marx, the ruling ideas of every era, are the ideas of its ruling class. Well, declaring yourself an enemy of the ruling class doesn't mean you've escaped that problem, right? We're still overdetermined, as it were, by the ideology that is adequate to the capitalist mode of production. And the ideology that is adequate to the capitalist mode of production is to do everything that is necessary to take your eyes off of the central problem of what is the logic of capitalism and what is needed to negate it. And that's why it took Marx like 25, 30 years to write Capital. Why did it take so long other than the fact that he was a 
you know, he was not great at meeting deadlines. <laughs> uh, he was not great at meeting deadlines because he was a thought diver, to use Herman Melville's phrase, somebody who digs in one spot for two decades to try to get this fundamental answer to the question. And we have a responsibility to do that to the best of our ability in our time. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel because we got Marx who did a lot of it for us. But if we don't appreciate the depth of Marx's own critique, then we're really kind of putting too much on our shoulders because then it, then it does sound like we got to start all over again anew, and I don't think we need to. You found a very good quote, a quote I'd recently just found myself. I've been looking through basically the collected works of Marx and Engels to look at everything they have said about planning. And one thing that might surprise people is that the word central plan never actually appears in any Marx or Engels text. You have this great quote here. I'll read it. It's one of Engels from a, a, his critique of the draft program of 1891. Capitalist production by joint stock companies is no longer a private production, but production on behalf of many associated people. And when we pass from joint stock companies to trusts, which dominate and monopolize whole branches of industries, this puts an end not only to private production, but also to planlessness. Yes. One of the greatest myths is that capitalism doesn't plan. No, capitalism puts an amazing amount of work into planning. But it's not like it's not rational planning by uh, those who are producing the value and the wealth. Right. It's 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 a planning that occurs behind our backs through the instrumentality of the law of value and surplus value. Now, of course, there are manifestations of this that are very clear. There's market research. There's R&D. There's all kinds of enormous amount of of, of energy, time, and money spent on trying to think through and plan out complex productive apparatuses throughout modern society, right? But of course, it's not, it's, as we see from the pandemic, it's very poorly planned, <laughs> right? I mean, if you have a situation where you end up with, you know, two or three factors in the world that can produce a given computer chip, right? The very high, the highest and highest, most sophisticated variants of them, uh, one being in Taiwan and one being somewhere else or something, and then one of those gets knocked down by, by the pandemic or simply suffers from lack of uh, not being able to produce as much as before for whatever reason, then you have an, the entire global value change is thrown out of whack. So that doesn't seem to be very uh, good planning, right? I mean, it's, it's very interesting, too, to see this war between Russia and Ukraine illuminates this as well, right? When the war begins, you get all these reports. People are very surprised. Russia doesn't seem to be doing as well as it thought it would against Ukraine. And they start pointing to its its lack of ammunition, artillery, shells, etc., and then saying that, well, Russia simply lacks the productive capacity at this point to produce armaments at the pace that it could have done some decades ago. Well, now we can find that that's also true of U.S. and NATO, right? <laughs> the Ukrainians are burning through more shells in a week than, than the U.S. and the Europeans could provide for them in several months. So what part of this is the law of value is to, for capital to migrate to where those arenas are most profitable. It's much more profitable to spend $150 million building an F-35 fighter than it is to, you know, spend a few hundred thousand or a few million here or there to provide the, the missiles that go along with the plane. That sounds kind of crazy, but there is a great deal of planning that goes into produce that F-35, right? But even more generally than that, I think the point here is that when Marx uses the term planning, it's very, it's very beautiful language. I mean, it's almost poetic. And it's funny how it doesn't show up in some of the English translations. There's a passage, for instance, in volume three, the manuscript of volume three, which doesn't make it into Engels's edited version of volume three, but it also doesn't show up in the a very fine English translation that was done by Ben Fowkes, which I highly recommend, of Marx's original manuscript of volume three. But the phrase doesn't show up there either. I don't know why exactly, but Marx talks about the free association of the producers who bring their associated reason to bear on the collective ownership of the means of production, that bring their collective reason to bear on owning the means of production. Marx says his great confidence of the workers as reason, that a true negation of the bourgeois property form is not just ending the property right of a given capitalist, and it doesn't even stop at putting that right into the hands of the working class. It's for the working class to use their minds to organize that system of production or distribution in the form in which it's conducive to our human nature. That's a very remarkable conception of, of a transformation of human relationships that Marx envisions 
That is what he means by collective ownership, collective control of the means of production. But the concept has been so narrowed over the decades, right? That people think of this as just, well, it's like we just come up with a, a planning mechanism. How many shoes are going to be produced in a month and how much leather do they need to go into the shoes? How much cattle have to be raised to go into that? How it's going to be distributed? How it's going to be organized? How it's going to be shipped and blah, blah, blah. I mean, obviously, any social system has to figure out these coordinates of input and, and output and consumption and production. But the mode of planning does not necessarily involve a centralized state for Marx. And that's why he doesn't use that term, centralized planning. And always, well, not always, but very commonly, the phrase that usually precedes when he talks about a social plan or a general plan or a definite plan is the term uh, society of free and equal producers. Right, always free producers. There was an interesting little debate that Donetsky had with Ernest Mandel on this concerning his introduction to the, uh, you know, the uh, English translation that was done in 76 or so the, of Marx's Capital, a very fine translation, by the way, again, done by Ben Fawkes and then Vines 2 and 3, David Fernbach. But there is the, Mandel's introduction, he speaks of Marx's concept of a society of associated producers. Now, that doesn't sound like, oh, that bad, right? But there's reason to take objection and say, no, it's not simply associated producers. It's freely associated producers. Uh, If people don't have the freedom to organize their workplace in a way that befits their natural and acquired talents and abilities, then what kind of socialism is that? Now, obviously, we have to make decisions of how to do that based on all kinds of factors that may not correspond to our subjective will and judgment. We have to figure out what to do in relationship to others. So you need some kind of national planning mechanism, obviously. But the notion of that being having to be a highly centralized plan that does not have some kind of direct input and control from the associated producers is one that simply is not accepted by Marx. And and in that sense, you can raise the objection that his conception of a post-capitalist society is somewhat utopian. I mean, he, I, I'm saying use that word utopian in a good sense of the word. Marx was not some, simply throwing the utopian socialists into the wastebasket and saying, forget about them. He brings Robert Owen in, right into capital, right, it, and says some pretty positive things about him. Although when you read Owen, I mean, it's extremely naive and you wonder why he would bother doing that. But there were, there were insights in Fourier and in Owen Just like there's insights in many within the anarchist tradition today that Marxists can learn from a great deal. But the point here is, is that he's not, and this is one reason we wanted to do this new translation of the critique of the Gotha program, is it's simply the English translation. All the English translations we found to date misrepresent what Marx says there. I mean, it says, it has Marx saying, the question is, what role will the state play in a future communist society? This is not what the German original says. It says it does not use the word der Staat for state. It uses Staatswesen, which the essence of the state or the nature of the state or more properly translated, that would be a too literal translation as state functions. So what role with functions that now pertain to the state, what role would they play in a future communist society? This conflation of the state with state functions, just like the conflation of concrete labor with abstract labor or the conflation of value with wealth, which we can get into more in a second too, this does a lot of damage. And people read the text thinking, oh, Marx is talking about the state persisting within communism, even the higher phase of communism. But that's not his view. So speaking of uh, of Marx's views on the state, then, you know, some of the most famous quotes on what communism means for Marx come out of the Communist Manifesto, where, where they are very state-centric. Do you want to talk a bit about how Marx's concept concept of of the state in communism changed over time? In particular, because even prior to, say, writing the manifesto, let me just check a quote here. We see in the German ideology in 1846 beforehand, where they talk about uh, a general plan of freely combined individuals is the is the translation I I have of that. So that seems to point still to that same concept of, you know, free producers or whatever, associated free producers. But then after that, he still he still talks about centralization of the means of production in the state hands. 
Right. But what's the context of, of him saying that in the final section of the manifesto? Is he talking, is he defining a socialist society or is he defining a revolution that establishes a democratic republic that would create the economic and political preconditions for a subsequent socialist society? Now, if, if it's the second, I think it is, because what was what was the state of the communist movement or the labor movement in general as of 1847, 1848? It was in no position to bring forth, and certainly in Marx's view at least, but I think by any objective historical point of view, it was not in the position at the time to yet bring forth a socialist society. So Marx is presenting the Communist Manifesto with realization that this is a long-term struggle. I mean, he uses phrases where it might take 20, 30, 50 years of civil war before we would get out of this domination of capital, right? And maybe that was a little optimistic. <laughs> but the point is, when he talks about the centralization of the means of production, he's talking, he, is that about, is that a definition of socialism or is that a definition about a, a period that would prepare the way for it? I don't even want to use the word transition to socialism here necessarily, but prepare the way for it. And I think it's the second. But that said, there is a conception in Marx early on that's somewhat naive about the state. And I think it's in some ways his earlier reflections in 1842-43, when he's engaging Hegel's concept of the state and critiquing it, are in some senses more philosophically profound than what shows up in the German ideology and some of his work thereafter, where you get a formulation like the state is the executive committee of the ruling class. But that's a rather instrumental view of the state, right? So if it's, if it's the executive committee of the ruling class and we put aside the ruling class and we now, the working class, become the ruling class, then we adopt the state to our to our purposes. And that certainly is something that characterizes a lot of, of people within the socialist and, and communist left right to this day. The problem with that is, are you capturing the state or does the state capture you? And I think we have an abundance of historical examples where the second is what happens more often than the first. And I think Marx begins to realize this, he's already saying it so in some respects shortly after 1848 in the 18th Brumaire, where he does say that the task is not to take over the existing state apparatus as much as to smash it. But it's not really made a category yet. Where it becomes a category for Marx is in his response to the Paris Commune, in which his own followers were a small minority, very important minority, but a small minority. And the first international, of course, was not a was not a Marxist organization. It was a coalition of a diverse range of tendencies. And the Proudhonists, Marx's longtime adversaries, were the main force within the international. But he saw in the Paris Commune something that demonstrated a non-statist form of organizing a, a kind of worker state, right? It, is, it does have a kind of state, the Paris Commune. There is a government, right? There is, there is legislation. There is, there, there is organization of a militia, et cetera, et cetera to put down counter-revolutionaries, etc. There is authoritarian power to some degree employed, but it's employed by, not only on behalf of the workers, it's employed by the workers. And there's no vanguard party there. There's no single party in control in 1871, right? You can't read that back into it. It wasn't there. So he calls that the political lever for the transition, a proper transition to socialism. And that is something you don't find in the manifesto and in the earlier writings. So yes, he, he does move closer, interestingly enough, to some of the positions of some of the anarchists, but at the same time, it's at that very moment where his battle with the anarchists becomes the most intense for a whole other series of reasons. I have an essay on that in Marcelo Musto's collection, uh, The Marx Revival. I have a chapter on Marx's concept of political organization that discusses some of this in more detail. And in the uh, International Marxist Humanist Organization, which I'm associated with, its website, uh, which is www.imho.org, has a uh, discussion between myself and a colleague, Fran Sam Friedman, on that essay and some of the ramifications of Marx's changing views of the state. So there is also some other translation issues that you've kind of come across, misinterpretations in the critique of the Gotha program. One in particular is where there is an incorrect translation of, of the word worth to value. I was wondering if you could speak to that misinterpretation uh, and, and the people involved with their misinterpretations. Oh, boy, that's a biggie. So uh, first of all, we have a, it's an advantage and a disadvantage at the same time. But I think it's let's start with the advantage. We have two different words in English to designate what, that for which there is only one word in German. In German, the word is Wert, uh, W-E-R-T. And that can be that can mean either wealth or value. It can mean material wealth in the sense of concrete objects of material, of material goods and services. 
similar akin to what Aristotle calls in his politics, household management, in which Aristotle contrasts the management of a household as against commerce. One is natural, the other is not natural. Value, that is exchange value, producing not simply for the sake of getting this good or service in the hands of the other person, but producing the good or service for the sake of making money and augmenting as much money as possible. And the good or the service is a secondary consideration towards the accumulation of wealth in monetary form. That is what we call value, wealth in monetary form. And that, whether it be Aristotle in discussing commerce in his politics, or whether it's Marx discussing the value form in his mature critique of political economy, sees this as unnatural, but historically necessary for a certain stage of human history in certain societies, but one that must give way to a higher form of social organization, okay, in which this division between wealth and value disappears. So in the Grinverse, he has that very beautiful passage, which is right at the beginning of the section on pre-capitalist economic formations, where Marx says, well, well, when the narrow bourgeois form is peeled away, what is what is what will wealth really mean in a new society? It will be the universality of needs, capacities, and enjoyments of the freely associated individual. It will not be simply measured by how much money or profit you have, right? These quantitative determinations will be superseded. In English, we have these two words for wealth and value, which again is helpful, as you can see from my discussion, because one, wealth comes out of the German wert, and value comes out of the French valor. But there is a problem when it comes to translation, because the ter- in German, you would know what is Marx referring to. Is he referring to commerce, or is he referring to you know household management? Is he referring to concrete material wealth, or is he referring to wealth that's accumulated in abstract or monetary form? And the only way to know, basically, is context. Now, and Marx can't help himself use the same word because you have to write in the language that's available to you, (laughs) right? We have to do the same in English. And and you can generally figure out from reading Marx when it means one and when it means the other. Now, there's a particular passage in the Critique of the Gotha program that has given rise to a good deal of confusion. And it's given rise to this confusion because especially given the context that it appears in. After Marx starts talking about making a distinction of lower and higher phases of socialism or communism, socialism and communism are not distinct stages in Marx, they're just interchangeable terms. So he means the lower phase of communism or the lower phase of socialism. It's not going to, you're not going to get a a full-bodied communist or socialist society instantaneously upon a revolution or even upon the dictatorship of the proletariat. It's going to take some time. It's going to be marked with the birthmarks of the old society. But then he talks about how in this lower phase of socialism or communism, commodity production is abolished. The law of value is abolished. There's no more value production. There's no more distinction of abstract and concrete labor because the workers have effective and not just nominal control over the means of production, along the lines of what I suggested just a few minutes ago. That then appears a passage where he says, I'm quoting from Marx. Here, obviously, the same principle prevails at that which regulates the exchange of commodities in so far as this exchange, now what exchange is he talking about? He says, in the lower phase, there will no longer be exchange of products. That's a kind of shocking statement. What we have a post-capital society, we don't exchange products anymore. Well, how do I get what I need? I can't produce everything I need. He says, well, strictly speaking, an exchange of products involves exchange value. And exchange value is the phenomenal expression of value. And value, what is the substance of value? Is abstract labor, right? And what's the measure of value is socially necessary labor time. So if you maintain, if you claim that in a post-capital society, there will still be exchange value, you're assuming the persistence of abstract and alienated labor, which means you haven't made an exit from capitalism at all. So he says, no, but you don't exchange your products. There is no exchange value. What there is is an exchange of activities. I contribute an activity to my community. I work, let's say, 28 hours this week. And in exchange, I get goods and services equivalent to what it took, takes to make those goods and services in 28 hours. So it's an exchange of one activity for the other of equal worth, of equal worth. I put in my 28 and I'm getting from the common storehouse an equivalent of what in our commune or community took 28 hours to make, right? It's a quid pro quo. Nah, there's still an exchange going on, but it's not an exchange of value coordinates. It's an exchange of material quantities or quantums of labor. One in the form of an actual amount of time you labor, the other, the labor time, the actual now labor time, not socially necessary labor time, that's embodied in the products of labor. 
Now, so back to the sentence. He says, here, obviously, the same principle prevails as that which regulates the exchange of commodities insofar as. Why is the same principle as an exchange of commodities? That misleads a lot of people. Oh, so in the new society, we have commodities. A paragraph before, he says there's no commodities. <laughs> it's the same principle that prevails. And what's that principle? You get what you put in for. You get what you pay for, right? Quid pro quo. You, you get what to get this. You got to put in that in a direct way, right? A direct exchange. In a, in a simply a formal sense, purely in a formal sense, you have the same principle that prevails in commodity exchange, even though you don't have commodity exchange anymore. Insofar, he says, as this exchange involves, that was it involved, involves all the English translations before ours say equal items of equal worth. Now, that didn't sound right to me for a long time. And I was really troubled by this. Because if that's right, then it would sound like the law of that value production continues after the end of capitalism. And then I find that actually Engels says something to that effect later in life after Marx's death, when he's in a dialogue with figures like Conrad Schmidt, et cetera, trying to advance the cause of social democracy, and essentially says that there's a place where he says, I believe it was the postface to volume three of Capital when he published it in 1895, that value, according to Marx, would continue in so many words, and say this directly, uh, it exists before and therefore, impl by implication, would exist after capitalism. Now, this was picked up by a lot of people on the left who wanted to argue that the law of value operates in, in so-called socialism. And in 1944, it was picked up by nobody less than Joe Stalin, who was facing a problem, aside from the fact that Hitler was knocking on his gates. And that was that a lot of people who were studying capital and, the, and political economy in the Soviet Union we're raising a lot of questions about we don't quite see how what Marx delineates as the logic of capital in the first chapters of Das Kapital, how that is something we don't have here. When we have, yes, we have state planning, but we have commodities, we have exchange value, we have kind of markets, even though they're state control. We have cost accounting, we have all these other things. I mean, is that really compatible with the abolition of the law of value? Well, Stalin and this big political economist came out with a very extensive essay. I don't think Stalin wrote it, but it was ghostwritten by Leon Tiep and a few others to basically say that, no, the law of value, there's a revision in the law of value. Actually, it does operate within socialism, but it's it operated by the state in the interest of the masses. So there'll still be value production. There'll still be socially necessary labor time. There'll still be abstract labor. There'll still be all that stuff. They don't mention alienated labor, of course, but <laughs> all this stuff will be. So that made me even more worried. <laughs> was Stalin misrepresenting Marx or was he carrying through for Marx? Now, this is where a lot of people might stop here and say to themselves, listening to this, oh my gosh, we're getting into the battle of quotations and, you know, Marx is the God and you got to bow before him and now we're going to fight over what he really meant about this word versus that word. Well, I'm not interested in that kind of scholastic stuff myself either. That's not my interest here. My interest here is conceptually who's right and who's wrong because that has very practical ramifications. And so I go back to the original, and I see that the original is not, is what? Gleichwertige, involving equal worth, Gleichwertige, which means, in the context, it means equal values. He has just said that there is no value production. He says, the labor expended on the products do not appear here as the value of these products. He says that a page earlier. So it can't be that he's contradicting himself within one page. If he is, he's not a very good thinker. And Marx was a very good thinker. It, it, it's, it would be completely in, uh, incoherent and inconsistent for him to think that he's saying the opposite on the next page that he's saying in the page before would undermine the entire point of the piece. What he, in this context, Gleich Vertiger refers to items of equal worth. They are material properties. You exchange this much hours of labor in one form for that many hours of labor in another form. Now we see this is what Marx was getting at, an abolition of value production from the inception of socialism. Now, you can't get an abolition of, so of value from the inception of socialism, of course, if you're a country that makes a revolution, even one as large as the Soviet Union, surrounded by a capitalist sea, let alone if you're an actual island somewhere surrounded by the world of capitalism, because eventually, sooner or later, I mean, you have to sell products, you have to import products. <laughs> 
you're going to have to base your economy on the so-called value of these products and these exports and these imports, right? So the law of value will dominate you even when you are politically independent, but you will not be economically independent. You will be under a kind of neo-colonialism. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing you can do. You can do many good things to try to improve the conditions of the working people in your country, but best to do so without claiming you've gotten to socialism. Best to do so by saying we're still within a status capitalist world and uh, we want to try to point the way out of it, but we're not going to be able to get a way out of it until a lot of other parts of the world jump in into this revolutionary process and help us as, the, as we can help them destroy the global hegemony of socially necessary labor time. But in the interim, we do as best we can without besmirching the idea of socialism by calling something socialistic when it's not. And unfortunately, that hasn't happened in the past. Why my life work is kind of devoted to helping to see that this doesn't continue to happen in the present and in the future. Yeah, there's an interesting quote by by Engels in the anti-during part three on socialism, where he says something about value here. I just thought I'd, I'd read it here. I think it's kind of relevant where he's after talking about planning for a second. Then he goes, people will be able to manage everything very simply without the intervention of much vaunted value. And then in brackets, he goes, as long ago as 1844, I stated that the above mentioned balancing of useful effects and expenditure of labor on making decisions concerning production was all that would be left in a communist society of the political economic concept of value. The scientific justification for this statement, however, as can be seen, was made possible only by Marx's capital. So that would seem to be him kind of saying that value won't be operative, but it will have, you know, some similar form on the outside. Absolutely. That's a very beautiful uh, a quote that you gave from Engels. And there, this is where my admiration of Engels shines forth. <laughs> I'm critical of Engels for many things that happened that, that he did, but mainly after Marx's death. But Anthony During is, an, is, a one, is a very good book. And uh, he captures Marx's position very, very well there. When Stalin issued his revision of the law of value in 19, 1840, 1944, he quotes Engels as anti during but leaves that sentence out and then has that other thing about that, from the later Engels about the value of the products, right? So they knew what they were doing. They pick and cho choose which Engels they wanted. Uh, I have an essay. Now, if you want to ask, like, well, why did Engels have a different position later than earlier? That's a very interesting question. I have an essay on that in a book that was uh, published by uh, Paul Grave Macmillan. Uh, it's a book on um, Engels in the 21st century, uh, uh, edited by Tara Carver. And I have a, I go through that argument and try to show that one of the issues was is uh, Engels was besieged with questions after Marx's death by historical questions like when did value production or production for the sake of augmenting wealth in monetary form, when did that begin and when did it become socially predominant? Uh, which is a question that Marx did not spend much time on. And in the course of trying to answer that question, he pushes the existence of value production as far back as 5,000 years ago, which I'm not aware that Marx ever came close to suggesting such a thing. He was trying to do something with limited historical knowledge based at a, at a time when he was, he was pressed to give immediate answers to people bombarding him with letters. What's, what would be Marx's position or what's your position, A, B, C, or D, issues that they really had not spent much time uh, working on. And so Engels, as part of that problematic, makes some of these questionable comments about value near the end of his life. I don't really blame him for it. I mean, how could you? I mean, God knows what I write, <laughs> what I'll be looked at in subsequent years when I'm writing quickly to respond to somebody in an email or an article or something about an issue that's not my area of concentration. That's why I try to avoid getting into those discussions, frankly, more often than not. But, but Engels' anti-during corresponds to the kind of position I'm trying to bring out from Marx, but it's, it has generally been buried within a lot of discussion of Marxism. Right. Peter, is there anything that we haven't covered then? Uh, is there anything in particular that you'd like to say before we wrap? Yes. The main point here is about free time. What is really a non-capitalist society is a society in which we have the freedom to organize our time as we wish. I mean, we do that in a way already within limited confines. You may sit down on a Sunday night or whenever and try to plan out your time for the week. How am I going to do this? How am I going to get that done? How am I going to organize my life, given the fact that time is finite and that there's it, never enough of it? 
But in a post-capitalist society, it's precisely this notion that when we exit capitalism that Marx is elaborating, we have effective, not just nominal control of the means of production. We abolish uh, the property forms that prevail in capitalism, and we abolish the production relations that prevail in capitalism. We get rid of both. We now have freely associated labor, freely associated producers bringing their reason to bear on organizing their work lives. This now opens the door to be able to manage our time in general in a freely associated way. When he now says in the lower phase of socialism and communism, it's not socially necessary labor time that prevails anymore. It imposes its schedule upon us from the outside, but rather we decide how much we want to work in a given cooperative, because we are still going to have to work after capitalism, but we decide what kind of, how much or how little labor to contribute. And based upon that, that will determine how much or how little good of services you receive from the community based on that. It's not the intensity of your work that, necess- that will decide, oh, I produce five in one hour and then you produce only two that determines who gets compensated. It's simply compensated on actual hours of labor. So the point is we now get away from socially necessary labor time. We're doing an exchange based on actual labor time. But what's the point to that? That simply for Marx lays the preconditions. It creates the objective material conditions by which then we can progress over time to a higher phase of a post-capitalist society in which we no longer have to worry about measuring our lives in terms of labor time at all. Because now that it's in our control, our labor time is under our conscious subjective control with others in our community, of course, because there's some deliberation and give and take that has to occur in this process. I can decide, well, maybe I can live on fewer you know, luxury goods or other commodities. But instead, I want to spend more of my time with my family, more of my time exploring nature, more of my time engaged in cultural pursuits, more of my time doing whatever, you know, that freedom now is in your hands. This allows the abstract time determination to be broken down to the point where as society gets rid of the muck of the ages, all the vestiges of capitalist alienation that attaches itself to us, as new generations rid themselves of this, what becomes the prevailing measure of life? Free time, not labor time. This is what we want, right? We all want to be masters of our time. And and like that the this whole destruction of alienated labor, both the work that we do won't seem as work, but as leisure. Right. And maybe it would not be necessarily seen as seen as leisure. Maybe even the idea of leisure itself would be transcendent because leisure depends on its opposite, the labor, right? Right. With, with, with labor, with labor transcended in a way, right? Not that no laboring would occur, but labor as we understand it transcended. In a way, leisure is transcended. There would, it's like there would be a unity of mental and manual labor. There would be a unity of, I mean, you would not feel yourself that you're doing, that when you're in touch with nature or when you're exploring life, you're not going to feel, oh, that's some other sphere of activity other than my what I do to make my living. The, the, these two distant, different spheres now start to, the distinction between them begins to fall away. So uh, Martin Haglund has a wonderful book of this life where he discusses this question of temporal determination and relationship to Marx in a very, very creative way through a critique of religion. But the, it's a very uh, fine work, which I've written a review of, and I would highly recommend it as as one of many people who are looking exactly at this question that a truly democratic socialism, a truly democratic socialism, how can a socialism be democratic if, if the people don't have control over their time? If something else controls your time, you have no democratic control over it. And right now, alienated labor, and most of us are engaged in it, means we don't really have that control. Now, we're never going to be able to have an infinite amount of time. No change in society is going to eliminate death. Time is always going to be finite. The question is, can we create human relations beginning now and anticipating that future society, as well as in a future society, hopefully, if we never get to one, can we create human relationships in which time becomes the space for human development? Right. It's it's interesting, you know, like we can look back to like 150 years ago and people were working in potteries, working hellish hours, slaving over, you know, the wheel or whatever. And yet we see people today doing that exact same work for pleasure. 
that it is not a kind of an objective property of the labor itself that makes it alienated, but it's the social relations in which it lies. That's a very good example. And what makes it so different? What makes it different of the pot of working in that factory and cursing every minute of your day? And the person who volunteers to go and spend their spare time making pottery because <laughs> uh, it does take up time and it does take labor. And it does take work and take some expense, too. Why do people voluntarily do the second when they volunteer when they wanted to rush out of the first? Well, it's because of that question of control over time. Right. You're absolutely right. And so we have the conditions within our existence right now to address this fundamental question. It's we don't have to like. It, there's a lot of theoretical complexities involved in this debate over alternatives to capitalism. But in a certain sense, we don't have to look to a book for the alternative, right? I mean, the books are very important, but we can look to our own daily lives and we can uh, see the elements already in what, what many of us are already doing or trying to do, that whether we're aware of it or not, is trying to capture time as a space for human development. Right, like in the critique of the Gotha program, you know, like probably the most extensive writings by Marx on explicitly on like a socialist communist future, it's focused fundamentally on the social relations and not on the technical planning capabilities. And that should inform, that should point us as to what is absolutely central to a socialist or communist society as the social relations and not like technical means of production. Right. There's no technical fix to the problem of alienation. It, it, what's the fix to the problem of alienation is is to restore the fabric of human relationships that in a non-alienated form. And if technology can help us in that, right? But w where the technology is feeds into the profit motive of capitalism, that's when the technology, as we all realize, becomes transformed into its opposite, even when it has an initially beneficial effect. Those of us who can remember the days when the internet didn't have any ads <laughs> and how excited we were at the way we could make connections so instantly around the world and communicate with people. And then it becomes a profit driven enterprise and it turns into something very, very different. And now social media has a different meaning in people's minds than a free and collective exchange of human capabilities. <laughs> Far from it. But the point here is, is that, yes, we have within our grasp, uh, within the, there are material conditions within the present that address the alternative to capitalism. And that is a practical work that's uh, very important to articulate, just like the theoretical side is very important to articulate. And the two should actually be in communication with each other. And there's certainly a, a lot of different, we can uh, hold another interview would be struggles, movements going around the world that are explicitly or implicitly focused on this question of the time, the time issue. And I think uh, when you say black lives matter, well, just to give us one example, what does that mean, right? Black lives matter. My time as a black person living in this world does not matter to this system. That time is so constantly cut short because of all these forms of oppression that uh, people of color are subjected to in capitalist society. So how, how do we reverse that? It's not just by you know, a verbal utterance. It's a transformation of the social relations, as you mentioned, that makes it necessary for the system to limit our time, our free time as much as possible and in extreme cases to kill us for trying to exercise that free time.